Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. I'm not going to start singing like Bono, okay? I just got to tell you that. <laughs> this is, it, it's great to be here. I, by, by the way, how many of us have been in this room about six times this year? <laughs> it's great to be here at the Country Springs. My kids love the water park at the other end of the hotel. Let me just say one thing. I have known Ralph Reed since I was 25, and you know what bothers me most about it? He still looks like he's 25. <laughs> I want to give you some good news and some bad news. The bad news, our country's on the wrong track. America is headed in the wrong direction. And the American idea could be lost for a generation if we stay on this path of debt, doubt, and decline. The good news, it doesn't have to be. There's still time for a choice. We have a choice of two futures to make in front of us, and that's the good news. We still have time to get it right. So we really have a choice in front of us. Debt, doubt, and decline on the one hand, where President Obama's taking us, or a renewal of the American idea. What is the American idea? It sounds like some kind of vague platitude. Well, you know what? America is not just a country with a lot of states. It's not Maine to California or Wisconsin to Florida. America is an idea. What is that idea? Our rights, they come from nature and God, not from government. They come to us naturally, before government. We're the first country founded on an idea like that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. And so this debate is being joined today between the American idea and the transformation that the president and his allies are trying to impose in the country. It's sort of between natural rights and this idea of government granted rights. It's between a constitution of limited government and economic freedom and this school of thought that we ought to have a living, breathing constitution, that there's no limits to what government can do. It's a debate between conservatives and liberals, or more accurately, classical liberals and modern liberals. It's a debate that is coming to a crescendo in this country. And while in this election, the debate won't be completely won or lost by one side or the other, one side's not going to completely vanquish the other, but this election will put in place a trajectory because of math and momentum that will last a generation, that will be very difficult to reverse. So that tells me we've got some bad news that we have to deal with. The math, the momentum, and the man that's bringing it about. Well, let's look at the math. We have a debt crisis coming. We know this. Everybody knows this. Turn on the TV and look at what's going on in Europe, and that is what could happen to us next if we don't get this situation under control. We can't keep spending money we don't have. We're spending, we're borrowing 40 cents on every dollar. The president just gave us a budget that says, let's just do more of this. He has a budget. His fourth one in four years, giving us a trillion dollar deficit every year for more spending, more borrowing, and a whole lot more taxing. The Senate, the Senate hasn't passed a budget in coming on three years, over a thousand days. We have a law, a, a budget, like a law that says not only is April 15th tax day for Americans, it's also budget day for Congress. Congress legally is supposed to pass a budget every year. We did it. We did it last year, and we did it this last week. <laughs> because we want to respect you by being honest with you. We believe that if Americans see the truth, they get the facts, they'll make the right decision. Now, that's the math. It's ugly. It shows a debt crisis. It shows that all those empty promises that politicians from both political parties have made to Americans over the last decades, if we keep going down the same path, will become broken promises. Broken promises to seniors who've organized their lives around these promises in retirement. Broken promises to people who are struggling to survive and get by. That's what happens in a debt crisis. Everybody hurts. Everybody loses. America's economy goes down. We want to prevent that. Now, what about the momentum? I just described basically the fiscal tipping point, but we have another tipping point coming to this country, which is even more dangerous, a moral tipping point. 
We could come to this tipping point whereby more Americans become takers versus makers. Where more Americans see the government as the provider for their livelihoods versus they themselves. You know, there are a lot of data and statistics out there. One of them that's kind of alarming is the Tax Foundation says that about 70% of Americans get more benefit from the federal government in dollar value than they pay back in federal taxes. 49% of Americans today aren't paying income taxes. There's a lot of reasons for that. Recession and plant shutdowns. The economy's not where it needs to be. But the question becomes, have we lost our zeal for the American dream? Have we lost our, our, our quest for the Opportunity Society where we make the best out of our own lives, we reach our destiny, we tap our potential, and we make our kids better off? And I would argue we're not. You see, a lot of people are down and out. They're not doing so well. I got friends in James who lost their job at the plant, and they're in a tough position right now, but they haven't given up hope on the American dream. But if we keep going down this path, if we allow this new health care law to kick in, if we allow all these new government promises, which are empty promises, to continue, then we might find ourselves in a place where more Americans see themselves as dependent, where we convert our safety net, which is designed to help people who cannot help themselves or to help people who are down and luck get back on their feet, where we turn that safety net into a hammock that lulls able-bodied people into lives of dependency and complacency that drains them of their will and their incentive to make the most of their lives. Whatever you call that, that is not the American dream. And so we have these tipping points coming. We have ugly math that we have to face up to. We have a momentum that's going in the wrong direction. And that brings me to the man. We have a president that is making it worse, that is bringing us in the wrong direction. You see, President Obama cannot run on his record. Anybody fill up gas lately? <laughs> I mean, I filled up my truck last night, and I couldn't even get it to full because it cut me off at $100 because the credit card <laughs> won't let you buy any more gas. It's ridiculous. Look at the economy. Look at people who are struggling. Look at the poverty rates. So President Obama cannot run on his record. The question then is, will he change his tune? Was he going to change his ideology? A lot of Democrats, centrists, were telling me after the 2010 election, He's going to be like Bill Clinton. He's going to triangulate. Don't worry. He's going to work with you guys, just like you know Bill Clinton did in welfare reform. Not this guy. This is not a Bill Clinton Democrat. He is committed to his ideology. He is committed to that transformation away from the American idea, away from our first principles. Okay, so if he's not going to run on his record because it's not a good record to run on, and if he's not going to change his tune and change his ideology, what does he have left? He's going to have to divide America in order to distract America. He is going to play in the politics of envy and division. We see it every day. He's speaking to people as if they're stuck in their current station in life, victims of circumstances outside of their control, and that the government's here to help them cope with it all. Look, when I was flipping burgers at McDonald's on the interstate as a kid in Janesville, when I was detasseling corn, when I was working for Oscar Mayer, you know, selling bologna, real bologna, by the way. <laughs> when I was working three jobs out of college, waiting tables to pay back my student loans, I did not think of myself as stuck in some condition of life as some victim. I saw myself on a road of opportunity trying to realize my version of the American dream, pursuing happiness how I defined it for myself. The idea that we're stuck in some station and that the government here is here to help with us, cope with it, it's an old idea. It's an idea that the president wants to create this new narrative so that we all think that if you go with the Republicans, oh, they're going to throw you to the wolves. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world they want to release you into, some Hobbesian state of nature. And if you want any security in your life, stick with us. I tell you what. It's a false choice. It's an empty promise. And if you want to look at what this false choice looks like, we've already been given a glimpse of what an Obama presidency unplugged would look like. 
And I literally mean unplugged. Do you see that little thing with the Russian president the other day? Unbelievable. If you see what they're doing in implementing this health care law, and by, mind you, there are still hundreds of new regulations that have to come out with this thing. If he is willing, in a controversial, difficult election year, to have these new government-granted rights trample on our constitutional rights, like our First Amendment right to religious freedom and religious liberty, if he's willing to do this in a tough election year, what do you think he's going to do after he never has to face the voters ever again in implementing the rest of this health care law? So, the good news. We can turn this back. We can do this. We showed you with a budget in Congress the other day how to get off of debt and decline onto prosperity, how to pay off our debt, how to re reapply our first principles. We showed you exactly how we can do this. And so we need to offer the country a choice of two futures, a sharp contrast, so that the American people can decide what they want their country to be, not some backroom deal or some commission. We owe you the respect of letting you decide what you want Americans and America to be in the 21st century. And if we win that kind of affirming election, then you have given us the authority, the responsibility, and the obligation to save the American idea and to save the American dream for a generation. We can do this. We can turn this around. The country's not going to be fooled. People know in their guts what's at stake. People know we are on the wrong track. And the good news is if we reapply those ideas that made us great, we can get right back on track. And that's what this is all about. Now, I want to make an introduction. Uh, I, like the rest of you, have a vote on Tuesday to make. And so I, like the rest of you, are thinking, what, what do I do? Who's the best person? I've known these gentlemen for years. Newt is a brilliant man. He's been a friend for a long time. He's got a big place in history. I served with Rick for, for years in Congress. I have nothing but good things to say about these men. But when I look at the vote I have as a Wisconsinite to make on Tuesday, what goes to my mind is, who's going to be the best president? Who's most likely, who's most willing and able to actually deliver on these reforms that are so necessary so quickly. And who has the best chance of defeating Barack Obama? <clears throat> I think this primary has been helpful. I think it's been constructive. I think it's, it's brought these issues to the fore where we're having the kind of debate we need in this country about the big ideas. But I think there comes a point where this primary can become counterproductive. Where if we keep dragging this thing on, it gets us off of the mission and the goal, which is this. Save our country in November by replacing Barack Obama as our president. That is why, for me and my vote, I think we need to coalesce around the person who we think is going to be the best president who is going to deliver these kinds of reforms with the courage of conviction and the tenacity and the experience and the knowledge and the ability to do it and who gives us the best chance of realizing this vision and putting it into practice and in my humble opinion that person is Mitt Romney this is big you know what Wisconsin, we have a big responsibility. We've got a big opportunity. The whole country's watching Wisconsin. And we Wisconsinites, on June the 5th, on Tuesday, in November, we Wisconsinites can take back our state, can reapply our founding principles and declare we believe in the American idea, and we Wisconsinites can help decide the fate of this country and then we will look back at this moment and we'll know that this was a time, the juncture in history, where yes, this generation stood up to do what was right, to protect the next generation, just like our parents did for us. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Governor Mitt Romney.